for today. We kind of had to change our plans up a little bit, and that's because Vi was unable to join us this week. So it's time for me. And my original plan, I have to postpone because I did not have time to finish the research for it. So I was uh, looking through my Google Docs, as one does when they write 50,000 scripts, mm -hmm. at some of my finished scripts. And trying to find one that fit the theme was really hard. So I decided that the closest I could come, which is going to be the biggest stretch we have ever had for a theme two days. Worse than shiny boy? Worse than shiny boy. Jeez. <laughs> I, I don't think it's quite that far, but it, it's kind of a stretch. Does it at least have alcohol in the story and like my third one last week? <laughs> Technically, there is one word referencing a type of alcohol in this entire 4,200 word script. And you did better than I did. <laughs> you and your long scripts, man. <laughs> Greek okay, mythology. Like, this is all I brought today. <laughs> so if you remember back to my last episode in February, I talked about how I had two scripts and you picked uh, All is Fair in <laughs> Love and War. This is the other one. <laughs> So yeah, that's what we're going to do. Let me see if my mouse will work with me. It wasn't wanting to cooperate earlier. Okay, I got it to work. Cool, cool. Okay, so, and then a last aside, this is going to be the last Greek mythology episode that I do for a really long time. And like, we're talking like the summer. <laughs> so it's gonna be a while. And I think you guys are going to like what I have planned, but I am a little sad to see Greece go away, but it's okay because this is a six for one. So six stories in one. one. My phone just made a funny noise that I've never heard before. <laughs> burp, burp. Tom's at the, ran out to the store, so I wanted to keep it nearby just in case something happens, but just in case he dies or something. He's too paranoid to die. He's gonna have- Oh, when driving, he's a maniac. <laughs> really paranoid about the internet. Oh, I love it. All right, so for today, I have six gods who experienced love with a mortal that sort of- Worked out like, really well. <laughs> like, I, I titled it Soulmates, but I don't really like using the word soulmates for all of these stories but there are a couple that definitely have that vibe to it so essentially the love that they have for these mortals is so tremendous that it kind of sets the tone for the rest of their lives and as gods they pretty much live for forever so yeah and then it wouldn't be fucked up fables if we didn't have some fucked up ones and let me tell you there's some fucked up stories hmm yeah all right <laughs> Uh, the gods that I'm going to talk about today are, in alphabetical order, hilariously enough, is Apollo, Aphrodite, okay, they're not in alphabetical order, whatever, <laughs> Apollo, Aphrodite, Eos, Eros, Selene, and Zeus. Zeus can suck a dick. I think you might change your tune when you hear the story about Zeus. <laughs> All I ever hear is that he is the catalyst for why so many things get screwed up. I'm not saying that any of these gods are great people, but these particular stories kind of show that side of the gods that we don't normally get to see. So humanizes them because they're not, you know, they're not um, a couple of them. Yeah. The other ones. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, I apologize. If anyone's a big baby, you might cry during this. I cry when I dream. <laughs> all right okay so content warning is incest rape death mentions of suicide brief discussions of pedophilia and a derogatory term nowadays that used to be used for intersex people unfortunately i can't go back in time and change the word but I'll let you know like when we get to that point and it's literally just a really brief mention of it but I just wanted to put that out there in case people get offended by it I mean no harm I love you all you're all beautiful all right 
First on the list is Apollo. He's my favorite Greek god. We all know that. Um, but I decided to do him first because his story is technically one of the first ones if timelines were a thing that actually existed in ancient Greek mythology. So Apollo is the god of the sun, medicine, archery, music, poetry, and prophecy. So, oh my god. I don't even have the word so on this freaking... <laughs> my word i'm sorry guys okay he is the one who granted the oracle of delphi their abilities and is the twin brother of artemis he is the son of zeus and the goddess leto who is the goddess of motherhood now goddess of motherhood is different than the goddess of childbirth so just so everyone's aware now hera was married to zeus this time and when she found out that leto was pregnant she was pissed because of course she was it's Le it's Leto, it's Hera. Hera. <laughs> no, we need Hera, Hera warning. <laughs> right. A content warning for Hera. She briefly shows up. Uh, she triggers Hera... me. <laughs> she triggers everyone. <laughs> Hera curses Leto to never be able to give birth on land. Now, in some versions, it's that she couldn't give birth anywhere that the sun could touch. But regardless of which version you go with, the outcome is the exact same. Well, it's anywhere that the sun doesn't touch, or the sun touches these, you just go inside. <laughs> <laughs> it's like any piece of land that the sun can't touch. I always heard it as she couldn't give birth on land. Mm. Is how it was always explained to me. But again, regardless of which version you know, it's the same place and it's the same reasoning, which is a technicality on how she gives birth. So, um, Leto searches high and low, and then she finds this island of Delos. So Delos is a floating island, floating island. So it's like a little bit above the sea level. So it's not technically land, which is how she's able to give birth on it. Nice. It's, it's a technicality. So um, Artemis is the firstborn. And then when it comes time for Apollo, she struggles. Remember, Hera's the goddess of childbirth. Not saying she had anything to do with this. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyways, it takes Leto nine days and nine nights to give birth to Apollo. And at the end, it actually requires the help of Artemis to finally like have him out. The twins are raised in Delos until adulthood. And then they- Wait, 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 wait. Twins. Yeah, Artemis and Apollo were twins. But you said Artemis had to- <laughs> <laughs> she did. And she she gave birth did. To the adult, the adult babies. So it's not really like said. So she helps her mom with Apollo, but then like they stay on Delos and are raised into adulthood. It doesn't really explain how old they are, but they don't come out like Athena, who comes out as a fully formed adult. But they don't come out as like Dionysus, who was an actual baby. They're it's somewhere, rules. they're <laughs> somewhere in between. <laughs> it's never explained. Just roll with it. Okay. Um, yeah, so they're raised in Delos until adulthood, and then they go and live about their lives. Artemis runs off to do her Artemis things, and we're going to focus on Apollo. Apollo runs into this total babe named Hyacinth. Hyacinth. Flower. Yeah, do you know the story at all? No, but that's a flower. Oh my god, okay. <laughs> it's a very uh, common flower. Does she also turn into a flower? Is she like the next narcissist? narcissist? So. <laughs> I can't say names. <laughs> so, Hyacinth is the son of King Amyclius of oh. Sparta and Diomedes. Or Diomedes, not Diomedes. That's a totally different person. Diomedes. Um, Hyacinth has a ton of siblings, but the most famous of all of his siblings would be his sister Daphne, who Apollo also falls in love with. I think and it's also a flower. To woo Daphne, is it? I think it is. I'm Googling. No, well, it could be. So I wasn't yeah. really going to go into it, but the story behind Daphne and Apollo is Apollo tries to... He tries to like woo her and sleep with her and she runs away from him and like calls up to the gods and the gods turn her into a tree. <laughs> like a uh, hydrangea. 
Yeah, like, so, like, or maybe it was a flower. I always heard it as a tree, but maybe it was a flower. Oh, it's a genus of between 70 and 95 species of deciduous and evergreen shrubs. Oh, so she turns into a shrub. We were both right. flowers, whatever one that is. So that's yeah. that. There you go. Are all of his siblings named after flowers or flowers named after... The, the only sibling that was important and that I felt the need to write down the name of was Daphne. There's only like two other ones that have a name, but no one cares about them. Huh, okay. <laughs> is what it is. All right. Hyacinth is a skilled athlete, obviously, because he's the prince of fucking Sparta. And the two hit it off instantly because why wouldn't they? They're both beautiful. They have a wide variety of shared interests, and Apollo actually teaches Hyacinth archery, music, and medicine. And they have like this friendship that the longer it goes on turns into love, and they are both completely enamored with each other and spend all of their time together. I fucking love this story. I'm sorry. I feel like he's gonna go the way of Enkidu. But happiness doesn't last long for the (laughs) birds. One day, the two are taking turns throwing a discus. So they're like playing a game of like throwing it and the other one's running out to catch it. Who can throw it the farthest? Who has better aim? That whole thing of just throwing this discus around. <clears throat> frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> made of stone though, so like heavy frisbee. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the original frisbee. <laughs> Apollo throws it a little bit too hard. So Hyacinth has to like race out to catch it because he wants to show Apollo that he is like a really skilled athlete. Like he can catch it. It doesn't matter if he uses his godly strength to throw it. But he misses the catch. And so the discus hits the ground instead. And because it was thrown so hard, the discus actually bounces up and it hits Hyacinth in the head. Oh, no. I mean, laugh or smile. I just, this is my reaction to sad things. <laughs> I laugh at sad things, so I get it. Oh, it's, it's horrible. So he gets hit in the head and he immediately falls to the ground and he is mortally wounded. No. Apollo rushes to his side and uses every ounce of his power as a god of healing and medicine to bring Hyacinth back and even gives him ambrosia, which is the drink of the gods that mortals are not supposed to consume. But because the fates have other plans, Apollo is unable to save Hyacinth, and Hyacinth dies. That's bullshit. So Apollo, in his grief, begs for the fates and the gods to make him mortal so that he can die and follow Hyacinth into the afterlife. But the fates said no, because they're exactly. dicks too. Yep. They go unanswered. So in his grief, he decides that if he cannot have Hyacinth, neither can Hades, and he turns his lover into a flower, and he grieves over it, and his tears create the pattern on the petals of the Hyacinth flower. And he vows to forever remember him and honor him in all of his songs. And there's actually an alternative version of this story that involves another suitor of Hyacinth, which is Zephyr, the god of the West Winds. And he blows the discus off course and causes it to hit Hyacinth because he was envious of Apollo. Um, they were both vying for Hyacinth's favor and attention. That was a little Hyacinth, less sad. Yeah, Hyacinth picked Apollo above Zephyr. Um, I looked up what a Hyacinth looked like. Um, yeah, they say that, like, it's supposed to look like it says, like, AI, AI on the leaves. Like, there's this pattern on the leaves, and it's supposed to, I forgot what it means. It has, like, a, like, a translation in it, but, yeah, they say that, like, his tears caused the pattern in the leaves, or the petals, not the leaves, the petals. I can't, I, I'm only seeing the flower, like, I'm not seeing the leaf, like anything on the leaves. Everybody's just no, no, no. It's the petals. It's it's the flower petals of a hyacinth. It should have like a little design, like a stripe thing going on on them. It, it's probably like not the easy. Yeah, yeah. It's got the little stripey pattern on it. And that's his tears. It, there's and kind of maybe a happy ending to this. Because eventually Hyacinth will actually be granted a place among the heavens with his sister Di- Dionysus, <laughs> his sister Daphne, um, at the behest of Artemis, Athena, and Aphrodite. 
So they all come together and decide that they both deserve a place up in that world so they get to live up there forever. Now, because it's Greek mythology and I have to tell you some history. So in Sparta, there is actually a giant statue of Apollo and at its feet, there is this like mm. simple-esque thing. And then there's a mound inside of it that is said to be the burial mound of Hyacinth. And the Spartans actually have a festival dedicated to Hyacinth called Hyacinthia, which is celebrated in the summer and it lasts for three days. On the first day, you have like a day of grieving and fasting, and then you spend the next two days celebrating the rebirth of Hyacinth as the flower. So like I said, there's it's a little bit, but yeah, they, he was obviously very loved by both the gods and his own people. That one's really sad though, like. I had to hit you with a hard, heart-wrenching story first. All right, so you punched me in the gut first. <laughs> So then like, the next done. one is what? Just a minor slap to the face? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. Again, for all the horrible things that Apollo does in his time as a god, I think the story just kind of shows like how deeply he can feel for someone else. And he literally spends the rest of his days trying to find someone to replace Hyacinth and never is able to. So we'll see. Next story. So the next story is that of Selene and Endymion. Do you know this story? <laughs> you do know Sailor Moon, don't you? Yes. Yeah, so you know, Sailor Moon is steeped in a lot of lore, and the Prince of Earth is in demand. <laughs> so, do you know the Greek story? And she's Serenity, you know, because Selene and in demand. Yeah. Not, no, no, we're going to say no. It's been a while. <laughs> You are never going to want to compare Sailor Moon to this story ever again. It's probably based off of it, though. Like, no. Are you sure? <laughs> maybe she. Maybe she just pulled the names because Celine Moon. I'm gonna tell you right now. She may have at one point been inspired by these. Sailor Moon is not based on this story. <laughs> I'm curious now. I want to know. Like, <laughs> the suspense. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. First, no. you punch me in the gut with sadness, and now you got my curiosity going, and the sadness is like gone. I know. <laughs> All right. Selene is the goddess of the moon, as we kind of explained. But before anyone gets confused, Artemis is also the goddess of the moon. Originally, there were three siblings, Helios, Selene, and Eos. Helios! <laughs> Our good, Pegasus! Good, good buddy Helios. What? No, that's not Pegasus. In Sailor Moon, he becomes a Pegasus, but it's not really a Pegasus because it has a unicorn horn, and Pegasus doesn't have a unicorn horn, if I remember correctly. I was going back to our OG badass from Hercules who gave Hercules the cup that he sailed around in <laughs> because he tried to fight him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah originally there were the three siblings so it was helios selene and eos and they were the gods of the sun the moon and the dawn respectfully and eventually helios and selene become apollo and artemis so apollo replaces helios artemis replaces selene and then eos is just kind of forgotten about um that day it, it is what it is yeah um, Celine's job is to pull the chariot holding the moon across the sky every night, forever following her brother Helios in his chariot that pulls the sun. So that's how we have the shifting of the days. And then Eos comes in the middle at dawn to have that break. Um, during her time in the sky, she happens upon a shepherd by the name of Endymion. He was a beautiful young man, and Celine instantly fell in love. So every night while he was out tending his herd, Celine would pass overhead and she would grow more and more in love until one day she wanted him for herself. But she has a job to do. So she goes to Zeus, king of the gods, to ask for his help. Now, Celine is technically Zeus's aunt because she is the child of the Titan Uranus, who is also the father of Zeus's father Cronus. wait hold on wait i gotta make sure is it aunt or great aunt so it would be great aunt so no yeah it would be aunt so 
you have Zeus. His father is Kronos. Kronos is... No, yeah, it would be great on. It would be great on because then Kronos' father is Uranus. So you have Uranus, then Kronos, then Zeus. And so Uranus has Kronos and Selene, Helios, and Eos. So they're all the great aunts and uncles of Zeus. Sure. No. Wait, wait. Sorry, wait I don't know. I'm too drunk. Hold on. They were the siblings of Kronos? Yeah, so they would just be aunts and uncles, right? Yeah, and Kronos gave birth to Zeus. They're just, yeah, okay, they're just I was right. I'm too drunk for this. Also, Greek Kronos families. is in Taylor. Greek families, let me tell you. Anyway, back on track. Selene asks Zeus for his help in making Endymion immortal, but more than that, she wishes for him to eternally sleep because she loves the way he looks while he sleeps. And now we enter the awkward phase of all mythologies, in which the story is a little bit different depending on the version. Yep. So, so just to point out that up until about that moment, it was very Sailor Moonish. <laughs> you, had, you had Princess Serenity, who was supposed to be taking over the Moon Kingdom and learning all that, you know, taking over from her mother, Queen Serenity, who sees Indian, who's a prince on the planet earth and falls immediately in love with him so she sneaks down to earth to kind of like spy on him for a while and but it goes a different way where he falls in love with her and i mean they all die in the end anyway but yeah <laughs> so it was kind of there and then just a nope hard stop <laughs> it's 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 a hard turn <laughs> it's a hard turn this is one of those fucked up stories i was telling you about Another common version of this story is that Zeus, seeing the love of Selene for Endymion, makes an offer to Endymion, and in turn, Endymion asks for eternal slumber as his immortal gift for being the paramour of Selene. Regardless of which version, the outcome is the same, as you will find with all of these stories today. Endymion is made immortal, and he is given eternal sleep, so he forever will lay under this tree that Selene passes every night. I'm gonna wait for you to take a drink before I finish this uh, next part because it's that intense. During the course of this eternal sleep, she will have 50 kids with him. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that is. <laughs> yep. I'm overwhelmed. Not by the amount of children she had, but by the, by the amount of rape that happened. Like, that's what is just... Yeah, and I would just like to point out that the Greeks were very um, feminist, I guess. They made sure that the women also did some raping in these stories. <laughs> well, I mean, it is not it is a, thing. Yeah. a fair narrative that we have in modern day time that men can't be, like, you never hear about it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's not a fair narrative. It goes both ways. It happens. Oh, and it so, yeah. they just, in these stories, made sure that, yeah, they didn't gender wash it or whatever you call it. <laughs> now, this one, though, this is like... 50 fucking kids. She rapes him 50 times at oh, least. at least. To have kids with him while he is eternally sleeping. And he's only like that because either he wanted to be or because she liked him that way. I'm gonna go with that one. I'm getting at <laughs> that one. The, the gods in these stories always seem very possessive. So I'm, I'm betting. Yeah, I, I know that a big part of it is like regionally or we found with some stories, it's even like gender, like females telling the story tell a little bit differently than men telling the story. So that's where I feel, because that's where you can see like the two different sides of certain gods and goddesses is that. Yeah, I that mean, that makes sense. In a lot of English history, it's always the men telling the story, which is why there's not a lot about women. Yeah. So yeah, it, that makes perfect sense. It's unfortunate, but. Yeah. <laughs> Again, there's no redeeming that. She rapes him 50 times while he's asleep and has 50 kids. <sighs> there you have it it hits me every time I say <laughs> it's like what <laughs> oh yeah you're welcome <laughs> next story is that's about it? that's it that's, that's he's just forever asleep continuously being raped until the end of time yeah dude 
It makes me wonder having the story with I got the rape. I just want to point that out. I'm, if that's why they never have Artemis paired with anyone, like Artemis doesn't have anyone that she like in stories is with. I know that they use the term virgin, which didn't necessarily mean the same thing back then. It just meant like an unwed young woman rather than someone who was actually not having sex. But didn't but, the Vestal virgins yeah. not have sex? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's really weird. It's like that whole, like, back then the word rape also meant kidnap. So like virgin, I think that was like the Christianity thing coming in is saying that like you had to be pure and not have sex virgin. Well, Whereas just, I think originally virgin just meant a young unwed woman. Well, I remember the Vestal virgins, like there's stories about them getting caught having sex with men and then being buried alive because you're not allowed to spill the blood of a Vestal virgin. So they bury them alive to execute them. I, I don't, I don't know. I, yeah, I, don't. I can't but, say I make a study of it, so I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, but it does make me wonder if that's why they never have like an official lover or whatever of Artemis. Or maybe she's the smartest out of all of them, watched all the shit that her family did to people in the name of love and went, uh, no, thank that you. Was, that was Hestia, my girl. <laughs> hers. <laughs> she was like, I see y'all shit, you stay over there. Bye, family. You make great story time on Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> so next story is eos and i'm gonna stumble over a couple of these names even though i practice them because i'm slightly tipsy tithanos 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 is what we're gonna go with because that's what first came to my mind tithanos so eos remember is the goddess of the dawn and is the sister of helios and selene eos gets around as any good girl should i suppose she has many 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 lovers but one in particular stole her heart above all others, and that was Tithonos, the Trojan. So he was a Trojan. We're covering a lot of Greece ground here with this. <laughs> um, he didn't come from an impressive lineage, and he was actually just a normal dude who just happened to be exceptionally beautiful. So he was just like a random dude from Troy. Cool. Um, but during her time... Yeah. Yeah, during her time in the sky, so during the dawn hour, she would go to Tithonos to fall in love, and they actually have a couple of kids, one of which, I didn't write down any of their names, but one of which Eos actually makes the king of Ethiopia, so it's like he kind of rises up above his station, if you will. Um, Tithonos is happy, and they're just like vibing during these couple of hours that they have, living their best life, but Eos knows that it's only a matter of time before something happens, because he is just mortal. So one day he's going to die. Eos goes to Zeus and asks for the same favor that he gave Selene, eternal life for her mortal lover. However, Zeus grants it, but Eos didn't ask for eternal youth. So he will still age, but he will live forever. Have you seen Doctor Who? Yes. Is it going to be like David Tennant's doctor where he just lived for so long he became this tiny little thing? So, <laughs> eventually his body withers away and Eos takes pity on her love and changes his form. Depending on the story, he either becomes a cricket, a cicada, or a grasshopper. That way, that then, way cicadas scream. <laughs> and then forever lives in this form. And that's it. That's the story of Eos and Tithonos. <laughs> Why did Zeus essentially like put this loophole on this one, but not the other one? So Selene specifically asked for eternal youth and eternal sleep, which kept him young. Mm -hmm. Eos only asked for eternal life. Wrong questions. Mm, yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Next up on our list, we have Aphrodite. You want to talk about a goddess who has a lot of lovers? She has so many. But today, her job, talking, technically. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Today we're going to be talking about. Her job is to love and be loved. Yeah, we're going to talk about Adonis today. Do you know Aphrodite and Adonis? The name is very familiar. Okay. But if he was a character in Xena, that might be why. <laughs> I have no idea. I never watched Xena. We've already been over this. <laughs> so, 
So Aphrodite is the goddess of lust and beauty, not love. And for everyone's reference, including Titania's, because I know that this is going to be something you are interested in, I broke down the love gods. So skip like the next minute or so if you don't really care about this. Forewarning, this is where that term comes in that I said some people might find offensive. I apologize. I can't change the name of this god. Here we go. Rapid fire. Eros, god of love and fertility. Pathos, passion and desire. Ameros, erotic desire and craving. Antarios, reciprocal love. Craving? Yeah. Nice. Aphrodite, lust, Dionysus, religious ecstasy, Hedone, pleasure, Hemeris, unrequited love, Hedigul, <laughs> I was doing so well, Hedilagos, sweet talking or flattery, mm. Han, fertility of wild animals, Pothos, sexual longing and yearning, Hermaphroditus is the god of hermaphrodites and effeminate men exclusively. Pathos is the goddess of seduction and persuasion, going back to our Pandora episode. Uh, Philotus, affection. And Pirapus is the god, that's an unfortunate name, is the god of intercourse. So those are all the Greek gods of love. So like Pira, that's the Pira from uh, no. Ruby? No. No. Uh, that's my no. character. No. Uh, Priapus is not the same as Pri is Pira. Pira like is said, Pira Puss. So that may be. Oh, P R I A P A P U S. Okay. Priapus. So Pira is the name that Achilles takes when he is hiding out as a woman. He goes by the name of Pira before they go off to Troy for the war. I hate to be Achilles. So the Greeks really loved love. And because I also had to include this, because a lot of people, I think, know this or are familiar with it, they actually have a full-on list of the different types of love that someone can experience. And so I went over those, too. <laughs> I like so, that idea, though. Because, like, I feel like as a culture, we're too wrapped up in love being a romantic love, and we don't give enough credit to friendship love or bromance, but in, a, like, a non-sarcastic yeah. way. <laughs> so it's said that there's like between seven or nine. I was able to find eight. Um, I don't know what the ninth one is that people talk about, but I think a lot of people don't cover mania, which is where they get seven from. Because if you remove mania, there's just seven. So we have Eros, which is passionate love, hiking back to the god of love, Eros. You have philia, which is platonic love. So that's a love between friends or like a brother's in arms, that sort of thing. You have agape, which is selfless love. So that's the love that you would give to strangers or like a love of your countrymen, a love of like your God, that would be agape. Storge is familial love. Mania is obsession. So that's an obsessive love. Ludus is playful love, so it's like your first crush, your childhood romance, like that pure sort of love feeling. Um, pragma is the love from a long-lasting relationship, so people who have been married 30, 40, 50, 60 years, that would be pragma. And then- I'm in pragma. <laughs> and then Palladia is self-love, so that is the love that you have of yourself. So that's the different types of loves and gods. Nice. <laughs> I worked hard on this. Just I can tell. And I have new words to use. So I can go to my husband and be like, I ain't pragma you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. He's going to be like, what the fuck? Pretty much. Or he, or weirdly, he's going to be like, know exactly what I'm talking about because he's weird like that. When we were in Hawaii, he just knew some Hawaiian words. <laughs> Spam. <laughs> We drove by a gas station. I don't remember what it was. He was like, that means the mountain. <laughs> I know random words and languages. I don't even know how I know them. Yeah. So, Weird. yay. Good list. I want you to memorize it, and we should do this again and, like, see if you can spout them all off from memory. Both lists. With pronouncing the names correctly. <laughs> okay, so the one that I stumbled over 
It's always S's at the end of names. Like we went over this. H E D Y L O G O S. I'd have to write that out. <laughs> yeah, it's S's at the end of Greek names that just throw me off every time. But, anyways, Aphrodite is the goddess of love, lust, and beauty. She is a vain bitch, but we love her, kind of. Um, and she doesn't like it when women are seen as more beautiful than her. Hmm. Enter Mira, the princess of Cyprus. She is beautiful, and her beauty is punished by Aphrodite, who curses her to fall madly in love with the with King Cinerus, who is the king of Cyprus. Yeah. <laughs> so for nine nights, she creeps into her father's room and has sex with him while he sleeps. All right, did not click. <laughs> her father oh my god I was like all right we got the names down my brain was processing those names <laughs> did not connect those two dots gross mm -hmm. yeah gross. yep yep but on the ninth night he awoke and he freaks the fuck out he disowns her and throws her out that night but she is pregnant <laughs> I love how they just always know instantly that they're pregnant in these stories it's funny so kicked out, she cries to the gods for help, and in turn, they transform her into a mer tree. Into a what? A mer tree. You know, frankincense and mer. Yeah, but pregnant? Myrrh. Like, does she have a baby? Or does the baby just become part of the tree? That seems cruel to the baby. We'll see. Aphrodite comes to visit her as this tree and takes the baby from inside the tree. I was going to say, does the tree give birth? Nope. <laughs> like this, or uh, yeah, Zeus's thigh. <laughs> thigh is big meaty thigh. <laughs> baby. <laughs> no. Um, she takes the baby and she actually brings the baby to Persephone to raise. Now there is an alternative version to this story, and it is that Mira was actually already in love with her own with her father of her own free will, which would be the Electra complex, heralding back to my Oedipus episode um and she raped him on those nights and when she was found out and fled aphrodite punished her for this crime by turning her into the tree but saved the life of the child that she was pregnant with because he was innocent whichever way ends up the same she turned into a tree she has a baby it goes to persephone actually honestly surprised that she saved the baby anyway because the gods often don't care <laughs> No. Oh. Now, the baby grew into a young man who is said to be the most handsome in all of the world, and his name was Adonis. Yay! <laughs> Aphrodite wanted him for herself, but Persephone would not give up Adonis because she was his mother now, and she didn't want Aphrodite to have any part of his life. Smart woman. Just saying. So what's a girl to do? Cry to your daddy, of course. Aphrodite goes to Zeus, uses her good looks to persuade him, and he can promises. Their daddy. <laughs> Adonis spends half the year with Persephone and half the year with Aphrodite. So, like, he's actually pretty reasonable on this, where he's like, just split the year half and half. Split the baby, half and half. Yeah, half and half. Um, so, this begins the love of Adonis and Aphrodite, and they are madly in love. But all good things must come to an end when we're talking about the gods. And one day while on a hunt, Adonis is gorged by a boar and mortally wounded. And he manages to make it to Aphrodite and dies in her arms. Aww. Mm -hmm. So she cries and cries and cries and her tears mix with his blood and it creates a flower called the anemone. We got a lot of flowers. Call it an Adonis. <laughs> <laughs> Aphrodite demands that a festival be held every year to honor her love. So we have the festival Adonia, which is, I believe, mostly featured in Athens. Um, so in this festival, women plant flowers or like quick uh, wilting like produce, like lettuce and stuff. That, like when it sprouts, like if you don't pick it up, it like wilts really quickly. Um, and so like when they bloom and die, they spend that morning 
that morning mourning the flowers as if it was Adonis. And then it's supposed to represent the transition of seasons and then the quickness of death for a loved one. And then my favorite part of this festival is that these women would then rip off their clothing and beat on their chests while screaming. <laughs> ah, I want, that is a dope ass festival. I'm is it still at. practiced today? I have no idea. Cause I was gonna say we should go. <laughs> we should definitely go. If it's not practiced, we should bring it back. I'm just saying. Bring it back. <laughs> yep. Just stand in the street with our tops off screaming, bring it back. <laughs> While we beat on our chests. <laughs> I think it's like us supposed to like mimic Aphrodite's feelings and what she did when Adonis died. I don't know. All right. Next. Next on the list is actually a child of Aphrodite and Ares, and that would be Eros, the actual god of love. And he is more commonly known by his Roman name, Cupid. And yes, he does in fact have wings. Does he have a small little baby head? No. <laughs> he falls in love with a mortal named Psyche. Now, this story will be my first fairy tale that's not Russian. Bob, I don't think Bobby Yaga counts. But anyways, um, this is a fairy tale in Greek mythology. You are welcome. So it's a so because Greek mythology is considered to be a, a kind of almost so, religious belief, and this is like a fairy tale. So it's a Greek story that when I get into this sounds like a fucking fairy tale. Okay. Okay. This it we we getting into some weird shit here. here okay. We Does it involve cheese? <laughs> no. You had to think though. <laughs> I did. These grapes are really good. All right. Psyche is the youngest of three daughters to a king. As she grew up, she became the most beautiful woman anyone had seen, and her beauty was said to rival Aphrodite. And the more people who saw Psyche, life. <laughs> the more people who saw Psyche, um, the less they worshipped Aphrodite, and that was not okay. So Aphrodite ordered her son Eros to go and pierce her heart with an arrow, and then cause her to fall in love with the most evil, vile creature he could find. So the story of Cupid with him with the bow and arrow is true he shoots you in the heart and then the first thing that you see is what you fall in love with that's how it works so and like hits you in the arm i i think it's like <laughs> heart seeking like it, it seeks your heart because like it just hits you in the arm maybe you just like get a mild crush <laughs> <laughs> Well, Eros sets out to do this, but the moment that he sees Psyche, he falls in love and is unable to follow through with his mother's orders to do this. He decides to omit this when he later returns to his mother. So he tells her that the deed is done, but it's not. The heart's in the chest, I swear. That's She's in love with the disgusting creature. I don't know what it was, but... All right, time goes on and Psyche sees both of her sisters married, but she has no suitors. This makes her become depressed and bitter because men would rather look at her than marry her. So they enjoy looking at her, but no one wants to marry her. Should say a lot about her personality. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch, you're pretty, but... Um... <laughs> In this despair, she approaches her father, and he decides to contact the Oracle of Delphi to ask Apollo for help. And help Apollo did, but not in the way that they wanted him to. Why would he? Exactly. So the Oracle tells them, as with all <sighs> Oracle of Delphi predictions, your daughter will marry a beast that even the gods are scared of. You will dress her in black clothing, take her to the tallest rock in your kingdom, and leave her for her fated husband. I mean, I could see this being like, love is the beast that all gods fear, so her husband becomes Cupid. That, that's my prediction. <laughs> I think that is a wild boar, and I'm more comfortable with 
her sleeping with a god than her sleeping with an, a boar. So <laughs> that's a story for another time. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, obviously, what they had in mind didn't go to plan. And now the family has to prepare their last daughter for her own funeral in the guise of a wedding. So they dress her in black, just like the oracle said. They bring her to this giant stone cliff thing in their kingdom, like the oracle said. <laughs> and they say their goodbyes and leave her there, just like the oracle said to. Now left up there, Psyche cries and cries, and she tries to console herself, but there's no use because she's about to be married to something that even the gods are afraid of. She asked for it, technically. She did. And time passes with no sign of this fearsome husband. So, in her despair, <laughs> sorry, I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> in, in her despair, and you start laughing. <laughs> In her despair, she stands up and jumps off the cliff. The end. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I was like, it's literally been like probably six hours on this cliff. That's a bit extreme. <laughs> oh, I had to. It was the perfect moment to put that in. Uh, Anyways. But it, fit, yeah. it fits in though. Like, Yeah. <laughs> so she does stand up and jump off of this cliff, but she doesn't die. She is instead rescued by a gentle breeze known as Zephyr, the god of the west winds. So he's said to be the gentlest of the four winds. I got this image of her falling off a cliff and then the wind just like smack. And just, <laughs> and like makes her go horizontal. I think the way that he is typically depicted is like, did you ever, do you know X-Men? Uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, Archangel Bishop, oh, one with the with the wings. He has the yeah. wings and fly. That's kind of how they always depict Zephyr. Is like this gorgeous man with like angel like wings. Neat. He's like because he's the personification of wind. So, um, so Zephyr carries her to a forest and then gently he doesn't just bitch slap her out of the air. <laughs> he gently sets her down. And then before her lies this splendid castle. And all I could think of was the castle from Beauty and the Beast. All I could think. She does the one thing you shouldn't do and she goes to investigate it. And she finds that it is lavish and beautiful with furs and gold and like satin furniture, the works. Does it talk? And then she hears a voice. <laughs> It's so fairy tale like it's ridiculous. It feels like this is where uh, Beauty and the Beast might have come from. <laughs> she hears this voice and it's sweet as honey. It's gentle, warm, comforting. It just like wraps around her. It's everything that she wanted. Evil. What it says to her is All you see before you is now yours. I am your husband. Take a bath, then come to dinner. And Psyche does just that. She, she, a logical person would have questions. <laughs> she takes the most amazing bath in her life. And then she goes down to the dining hall, sits down. There is this like full buffet table of dinner full of all of these foods that she has never seen or tasted or smelled. And it's just like beyond her Our wildest guests, imagination. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for the gray stuff, it's delicious. Don't. It ground up human flesh. <laughs> <laughs> so she eats dinner. No one shows up. It's just, just this table of food. No one shows up. She eats her dinner. And then as night, you know, as she finishes eating and night drews, drews closer, draws closer, the voice talks to her again. And it tells her, retire to bed. I will join you, but you are not to look at me. And Psyche, strangely enough, listened. Be the phantom? <laughs> He's the trap door lover. <laughs> oh. oh, goodness. We're just going to have eventually an episode of nothing but past episode references. <laughs> it's, there's so many. Oh, my neck. So, so many. Anyways, where was I? 
Uh, retire to bed, I will join you, but you're not to look at me. Okay, so she listens and she goes up. I assume she goes up the, I didn't just imagine being the beast. She goes up the stairs. She turns left, not right, or whatever direction it was, enters the bedroom. She puts out the lights. I don't know why I said turned out the lights because we're talking candles here, but she turns out the lights. <laughs> she just hits the switch, all the lights go out. Fine, clap off. Yeah, and she lays in bed, and uh, she's starting to kind of, like, drift in, you know, like, you're in that nice little space between sleep and awake, and she feels this presence of another person get into bed with her behind her, and it's just all warmth and comforting, and she feels happy, and then she falls asleep. Nothing happens. They just literally snuggle in bed, and she, she wakes up pregnant? No, no, not at all. Okay. And in the morning when she wakes up, there's nobody there. And this just goes on for weeks with her going about her day in this castle. Every one of her wishes is given to her, like anything she could want, she has. Food is always prepared for her. At night, you know, when she's getting ready to drift off, she feels this person come in behind her and they just live like this. And the voice just keeps talking to her and telling her, you know, like, this is, I'm your husband, being very loving, everything like that. And she never questions it. Not once does she think to question this. She's living in the lap of luxury. <laughs> yeah. Money I does weird things to people. Let me tell you. <laughs> but she starts to become lonely because there's no one there. It's just her. And a magical so he, she doesn't have like a conversation to the voice or anything he just speaks no no she she talks to the voice but like there's no one there okay okay so one night as she's laying there getting ready to drift off and like feels him behind her she asks him if he will allow her sisters to come and visit and at first he's like no 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 visitors but she like keeps pressing it and eventually he gives in and allows her sisters to visit because he sees like how lonely she is not having that human physical contact that she mm -hmm. needs. Because lying next to somebody at night is not enough. The next morning, the next morning after this conversation, her sisters arrive <laughs> and she happily shows them around and tells them everything about this crazy house. And they tell her to run. <laughs> <laughs> and her sisters start to question her about this mystery husband. Who was he? Was he a monster like the Oracle had said? You know, he's keeping you captive. Why are you staying here? What's he like? Is he mean to you? Is he violent? All of this stuff, on and on and on. And Psyche kind of starts to doubt herself and this husband that she seems to have. And then that evening, the sisters leave. And then she has dinner like normal by herself, this grand buffet, and then goes to bed. And then when all of the lights are out and she's lying there, her husband joins her and they fall asleep. Well, he does. Psyche doesn't. So Psyche wakes until she is sure that he is asleep. And then she gets up quietly, like sneaky, 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 sneaky. Oh, wow. That, that's that's going to be haunting me forever. <laughs> and we have our new intro. <laughs> so she's all sneaking around that's that's what's gonna be from forever now i just imagine glebin sneaking around <laughs> and so she lights a candle like all hush hush i don't know how you light a candle all hush hush because it takes me like 50 tries to light the fucking match to begin with but whatever so she lights this candle, makes her way tiptoeing to the bed. <laughs> and she like leans over the bed where he is and holds the candle over him so that she can see this, whatever it is, it's called her husband. And what she finds is a man, or some might say a God, who is the picture of perfection and so handsome that it literally stole her breath away. I mean, she doesn't die, but like, <laughs> that'd be funny. Not really, but death is not funny, but whatever. So she is so enraptured looking at him 
and like loses herself in looking at him, the the candle has like started to pool wax and her hand tips and the wax and hot oil fall out onto him. And he wakes up with start. And it's like this moment of like shock and panic. And then he sees Psyche there looking at him and he's immediately pissed the fuck off because she wasn't supposed to look at you him. You had one rule. One rule, do not look at me. And he pushes her away and he goes to leave. And Psyche's like, no, 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 stop, stop, please forgive me, come back. And he speaks to her one last time before he leaves. And what he says to her is, I have given you everything and you betrayed me. Return to your sisters who you value over me. There can be no love without trust. And then he spreads his wings and flies out the window. It was Angel. And leaves her alone. And with those words, Psyche knows exactly who her husband was. This person that she had doubted and spurned and that all of the gods were afraid of was in fact Eros, the god of love. Ah, because love is terrifying. <laughs> She weeps for the loss and tried to think of a way to bring him back, but she couldn't come up with any way to even reach him, let alone convince him to come back. I put I'm instead of in, so I got real confused for a second. <laughs> so in his heartbreak, Eros returns to his mom, Aphrodite, and tells her exactly what has happened. And Aphrodite was pissed. Because... She wasn't like mad at Eros for what he did, but she was mad. I at do her wife. She should be mad. <laughs> She's mad at Psyche because like Eros gave her this love and this life, and then she destroyed it. And so he's a broken down son. So she's she's mad at her. Makes sense. So Aphrodite appears to Psyche after a few days of letting her wallow in her self pity, and proposes a trial to her. She would help Psyche get back with Eros if she performed four tasks for her. Now, Aphrodite knew that these tasks were going to be impossible because she was going to pick impossible tasks, but Psyche doesn't know this. And obviously she doesn't question much in life, so she accepts the help without really thinking about help. Is Psyche in love or is she just like he was the perfect husband? Okay. That's an answer. <laughs> it doesn't say. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. He seems like the type of person, perhaps, that, you know, just liked having a god as a husband. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, she didn't know anything about him up until she saw him. Like, all she had was a voice and knew that something, like, like it had a physical form because she could feel it. But, I mean, she spends, like, months doing this. So I feel like she has to, in some way, love him. It's just that she had that, like, doubt creep in. You know, like, when you've been doing yeah. it for that long, not seeing him is just, yeah. And her sisters, it's all her sisters' fault. They're the ones who made her question everything. So, I don't know. I guess, I guess yeah, she probably does love him. I don't know. All right, anyways. Aphrodite brings her outside to this, like, forest area. And there's, like, this large mound of junk. And she tells her that she needs to sort all of the different items into different piles and then just disappears. I just God magic. I don't know how it happens. And leaves her to this task and then like goes to be with Eros. Psyche starts, stares, she stares <laughs> at this mound and just feels overwhelming despair because as it happened, because. As it happened, a large colony of ants passes by and they stop when they see her crying because they want to help her out. And so they, she tells them like, I have to divide up this pile and all the, this big pile into little piles based on what it is, but there's so many different things intermixed. How will I ever do this? So they offer their help and together the colony of ants and Psyche divide this large mound into different piles. What is this mound made of, you ask? Poop. Well, it is made of barley, millet, poppy oh. seeds, lentils, and beans. <laughs> that's, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Task one is done. We have four. They, these don't have a fancy name like the Grapes of Wrath or like the Trials of Hercules or whatever the fuck. <laughs> 
So the next task is simple. She just had to obtain the wool of the Golden Fleece. I kind of vaguely talk about the Golden Fleece. That was Jason's lovely task that Hercules set about doing before he went off to do his own thing. And, you know, Jason is the love child of Hera. So no one likes him. Um, So Jason has not actually gotten the sheep swole yet that was a really odd I don't know why I paused the way I did saying that sentence but I did <laughs> so she has the ability to go and get this place so Psyche reaches the place where the sheep lives and she has no idea how she's going to sneak up on this one sheep and a group of sheep without scaring them to get this wool but as it would happen nearby was a reed and that reed took pity on her and offered his help it's a fucking fairy tale in Greek mythology. I don't know. <laughs> I have no answers for you. It's God magic. I don't know. So the sheep really likes to like run around and frolic. And so he gets his wool all over shit. Like it's just everywhere. So Psyche thinks the reed and looks around in the bushes and finds a piece of wool. And boom, she got the wool of the golden fleece. Didn't say how much. Exactly. So task three is that she has to fill a vase with water from the river that the river Styx ran off of. So basically, she has to find the start of the river to the underworld and then bring that water to Aphrodite. Easy peasy. Well, easy to find because they don't care who goes wandering into Hades. They just don't like people leaving. But the tricky part is that the water flowed over this insanely sharp, jagged, slick rock thing that could kill like a god if they even attempted it, not to mention like a mortal woman. So she it's like this like crazy river waterfall thing that leads into the sticks, and she has to get that water. So the Olympians are watching now. I like to imagine, thank you, Percy Jackson and Uncle Rick, that they have this little TV because they have Hephaestus TV in Percy Jackson, <laughs> which Hephaestus sends what? stuff to. He's making a lot of noise. He just walked in the door. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so like Hephaestus has like this little TV program that the demigods can watch about the gods. And, it, and that's how they like watch the mortals through Hephaestus nice. TV. So that's what I imagine it is. And like every hero of mythological story is on this channel. Like you can just flip through it and they have like movie nights or whatever. So that's what I like to imagine. Zeus catches wind of everything that's going on, and he thinks that Aphrodite is being way too harsh. <laughs> Zeus, of all people. Right? Yeah, like... Being a mother must have really hit him hard. <laughs> yeah, I don't... A mother of two. He has two kids <laughs> out of his own body. Like, man. <laughs> Lord. So Opening he sends, him up over time. <laughs> he sends this eagle down to help Psyche by taking the vase and like flying up to the water and filling it up for her. Now, Aphrodite is livid because that's three impossible tasks down and there's just one to go. But the last one, oh yes, this is a beautiful one. It's a doozy because she's like, ooh, I need to make something real impossible. So Psyche has to bring Aphrodite the box that contains Persephone's beauty cream. Don't ask, I don't don't ask. <laughs> I know if it was me reading the story, I'd be like, what the fuck? They have beauty cream? Don't ask. Apparently guys need it. Uh, apparently it does because dealing with Eros and his grief has just made Aphrodite's beauty fade and she needs this cream to bring it back for a theater trip that the gods are having. That is literally what she wants this for. I'm not even joking. <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> Ooh. Right. Now, how do you enter the underworld? We've been over this many times, but for Psyche, apparently, you just need to plan to commit suicide, climb the tallest tower, and the moment before you jump off, it will suddenly start talking to you and tell you how to find the way into the underworld. Okay. Legit. It checks out. So we have, we have talking ants, talking reeds, an eagle that carries a pitcher of water, and now a talking mountain. Mm-hmm. We got the tri tri what quartet. <laughs> I have no idea what the other trifecta. I don't know what it is when you go up to four. <sighs> so this 
rock spire thing tells her that in order to go to the underworld, she needs to go to Dis, and she needs to carry a cake and two gold coins, and she's not allowed to talk to anyone until she reaches Persephone. Super easy. No trouble whatsoever. She makes it to Dis. She um, has two gold coins. She has her cake. She's walking through the underworld. She passes some people. She ignores them. She gives the cake to Cerberus. One cake, not three, so it's distracted. She gives the cake to Cerberus. And then she pays Charon his fee, the two gold coins, to take her across the river Styx. And there she meets Persephone, who is totally down with helping her out, as any woman would be like, yeah, yeah, here, have some beauty cream. Hands her this box and sends her on her way. And Psyche leaves the underworld. And she is so close to completing this task. Oh. But she throws it all away because she has to look inside the box and see what cream would make her more beautiful. Because if it's good enough for Aphrodite, it has to be good for her. Now, when she opens up this box, this jar, this box, there is no beauty cream inside. Instead, what she finds is a sleeping curse. Uh, was Persephone cursing Aphrodite? I think maybe. I don't know. This is what happens when she has to split Adonis between the two of them, you know? There's a couple <laughs> feud going on. I don't fucking know. Oh, man. Uh, she had a warning. <laughs> well, Persephone never told her not to open it. She just opened it. Yeah, she should have warned her and said, look, where are you? Don't open it. So she falls asleep. Yeah, so she falls into a deep sleep that nothing wakes her. Forever? So, going back to Eros, who has spent all of this time in his bedroom at his mom's house crying over Psyche and trying to figure out how to deal with it. And his feelings are hurt and he doesn't know what to do and his mother is just being an overbearing dick. So, when it all becomes too much, he's like, I just need to see Psyche again. I need to talk to her. It'll make everything better, right? So he flies away, mostly to get away from his mom, and searches for her. And he finds her asleep with this box. Is she still like in the underworld? No, she made it out. Okay. Yeah. So she's just lying somewhere with the box asleep. So he pulls the sleep from pulls the sleep from her eyes, puts it back in this box, gathers up Psyche in the box, and returns to Olympus. Psyche awakens when they get to Olympus. She gives the box to Aphrodite. She has completed her four tasks. And then Eros asks for the blessing of Zeus to make Psyche immortal, and he wants her. Because Zeus agrees on the condition that Eros is available when he's needed to switch out an old partner for a new one. So basically Zeus is like, I'll let you have Psyche if you will help me sleep with mortals. Gross. Pretty much. So Psyche is given ambrosia, the nectar of the gods. She becomes immortal has a dope-ass wedding, and lives happily ever after with Eros. Like, literally. She's now a god. Aphrodite likes her because mortals are worshipping her again and not Psyche, and all is great. So there's your one happy ending out of these five stories so far. I have one more for you. <laughs> <laughs> so this last one, I don't know if you remember who the last one was about, is the god Zeus and the mortal that he fell in love with. Now, I had actually never heard of this story, and this is the most straight washed story I have ever seen in my entire fucking life. Let me tell you. Because we know Zeus fucks everything. Men, women, yeah. goats, snakes, like, <laughs> yeah. he has no, like, he is the epitome of, like, what, what do you call it? It's not, it wouldn't be bisexual. And Pansexual. Pansexual. Forgive yeah. my ignorance. <laughs> That's okay. So, yeah. It, it, this is a straight wash story. I'm going to tell you right now. Hmm. So, here we go. The story of Zeus and Gynamedes. Sorry, it's a really intimidating name and it ends with an S. <laughs> I have to think about it. Gynamedes is a simple sheep herder of Troy who is said to be the loveliest of the race of mortals, as with all of these stories. He settles himself on Mount Ida, minding his own business, tending to his sheep, and Zeus sees him from Mount Olympus and is immediately in love. So he turns into an eagle, swoops down to Mount Ida, and takes Gynamedes to Olympus. 
And once they're there, he gives Gynamedes the place of Hebe as the official cupbearer to the gods. And he's Careful, that's a dangerous position. <laughs> he's made immortal. So this position gives him a lot of prestige and it gives Zeus unlimited access to his lover. So Zeus pays Gynam Gynamedes's father, the father of Gynamedes, <laughs> with divine horses as essentially a dowry. So he's like, I'm paying for your son with some horses. Here you go. Now Zeus is still married to Hera, always. And she is pissed no fuck off. In the god world. Yeah. <laughs> she is pissed off to no end because not only was Hebe her daughter, which we know later marries Hercules, but now this lowly mortal is not only the lover of her husband, but has just replaced her own daughter in her job. But Zeus is actually really dope about this, and he refuses to let Hera do anything to him. So Hera oh. is not allowed to do anything. Unusual. I know. So Gynamedes is able to do what he needs to, being the cupbearer. Now, eventually, while he's up on Mount Olympus, he looks down to the mortal realm and sees all of the pain and suffering of the mortals on Earth who are actually dying of thirst at this point. So they have, like, no way to drink, nothing to drink, nothing. And the gods are refusing to help. So my dude makes a protest, and he refuses to serve drinks to the gods. So he pours out the wine. Ha, there's my drink. <laughs> <laughs> the wine, water, and ambrosia of the gods, and it's like, no, no more. Now, normally you would think Zeus would do something like smite him down, right? No, he doesn't. Zeus sees the pain in his lover's eyes and grants him relief, so he turns him into the constellation Aquarius, which allows him to bring water to the mortals like he wanted to. Instead of, like, actually helping, he's just like, <laughs> I honestly thought you were going to say something like he took his emotions away, which is, I mean, he's just like, mm, I'm done with you. You go be in the stars. No, get to help your humans, but no. With you. <laughs> when I said that this was a really straight wash story, in most versions of the story, Gynamedes is just his friend. Really? Yep. yep. Swear to God. He's just this bro dude that Zeus had a really cool friendship with swoop down, put in this place, and just eventually made Aquarius. I told you it's the most straight wash story I ever heard. When I saw it, I was like, hold up. <laughs> I can just accept love comes in all forms. Like it's also the fucking Greeks. Like, come right. on. <laughs> like, you can't. Uh. Like, there's a reason why the Spartans did so well, and it's because they encouraged their troops to have sex with each other because it builds stronger bonds. Like, historical fact. Now, a couple things before we wrap up, so that was my last story. Just some fun little tidbits. So Aquarius sits adjacent to Aquila, which is the eagle, and it is the constellation associated with Zeus. So if you look up into the sky, Aquarius sits next to Aquila. And the planet Jupiter's largest moon is named Gynamedes, and Jupiter is the Roman equivalent of Zeus, for those who don't know. So the largest moon is named after Gynamedes, which I thought was actually really cool that they've, like, made those connections, you know. Yeah, but he still didn't have to just, like, yeah, will yeah. him away. <laughs> so um, a couple more fun facts. Gynamedes is actually seen by some as the god of homosexual love, and he becomes friends with Eros and Hermes. And I didn't, I, I haven't mentioned this in any of my previous myths, um, but I did talk about how like there was pedophilia going on in these stories briefly. So in Greek myths, when someone, when a man, a dude, is referred to as like a shepherd or a herder or something like that, that typically was a job only given to young men before they would like set out to be an adult. So it's a role for like preteen and teen boys. That that's just what it was. So in all these stories, when they talk about what happens during those times, they're not actually adults. They're still children, technically. Mm -hmm. Now, like written today, it would be considered pedophilia and like no, no. But because that wasn't the way that they viewed it back then, 
didn't have the same like view whether it's right or wrong is totally different but historically speaking this was very common and like it's one of those things of like people don't like going back and retroactively labeling people because it just wasn't how they identified or what they saw you it as modern terms on history yeah. yeah and i mean like it was common for women to be wed at like 13 14 and have kids like yes we don't think it's right now but like the same thing happened to men it was you know so anyways just wanted to point that out that this was a thing it's never framed that way in these stories and just kind of like left up to your imagination but when we talk about that in greek myths that's what we're referring to it came up while i was doing research on this story it's the only reason i put it in there because <laughs> i had no idea <laughs> so i thought it was interesting it was a little bit of food for thought and um yeah that's my that's my story with my one word one word like cup bearer though is like i just imagine serving wine all day so technically well, i mean yeah like wine and but mostly like ambrosia you know drink of the gods mm -hmm. but yeah like i said i definitely stretch that a lot it's okay though. to be fair it was already <laughs> written true and it was a last minute change so it's true 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 <laughs> but that was a roller coaster i know which i need to know what your favorite story was of those six i'm just curious for whatever reason it's your favorite <laughs> <laughs> it was we ran the gambit with today's stories i know i'm like like my mind instantly goes to psyche but at the same time i actually hate the ending <laughs> like you wanted it to be tragic no it's there's just i don't know something about her that really bothered me <laughs> i don't know what it was i didn't necessarily want it to be tragic but it was just like man happy little after i was like oh really <laughs> Um, why does she get a happily ever after but hyacinth doesn't i don't right. understand it I, like so i really like that story it was very sad it, it is very sad it yeah i'm like everyone else kind of got something you know but adonis and hyacinth are the two that didn't you know what i think i don't like about like the story of psyche actually another thing about it I really don't like that he, like, she did one thing wrong and he was just like, I'm out and left her. And so she went on this journey, like, in a mature relationship, they would have had discussions. Yeah, it was wrong of her to do that. She should have maybe asked him, you know, like, why can't I see you? And they talked about it until eventually she could see him. But, like, did he ever give her that chance to have that discussion? I don't know. So I think that's one reason I hate, because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like she kind of got the short end of the stick a little I mean, bit. In his defense, in his defense, he is the god of love. And for him, if you don't have trust, you don't have love. No, I so, understand. But like, couples go through trust issues. She broke it. Like, it's normal to have broken trust here and there. Saying that that helps you reason. build trust. You know, like if you go through something where your trust is shaking, that you can, that can be the foundation to build yeah. better trust. All I'm saying is for someone who's so desperately in love, he sure as hell gave up like immediately. <laughs> I think in one of the versions of the stories, the reason why he falls in love with her is like he comes upon her and she's sleeping. And so he's like gonna go and like poke his arrow to her and he sees her and like, stumbles or fumbles it or whatever and he touches himself with his own arrow uh, and that's like why I like that I like that, one. I like that one better <laughs> yeah but then it's like also brings up that whole like you know can he be affected by his own arrows and like was he in love with her before he touched himself with the arrow or not because you know like that's the whole thing is like if you're already in love the arrow doesn't work because you're already in love and if you're carrying that something that powerful like tip out tip out man <laughs> yeah it was something like he wasn't going to shoot her because she was sleeping so he was just like gonna walk up to her and do it but he like 
It's kind of like when you said like, oh, does she get shot in the arm or something? Like he doesn't touch his heart. He like, it like falls out of his hand and like touches him. Like it was like a, like he literally fumbled his own arrow and touched himself with it. I don't, I don't really like that version. That's why I didn't tell it, but that was. So I, I think <laughs> there's only three that I could have a good conscious, conscious about liking. <laughs> like. <laughs> So not Celine and Endymion. Yeah, no. <laughs> Neither the, uh, the uh, oh God, the daughter that slept with the father. Oh, Adonis. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Hyacinth. Oh, that's my favorite too. Yeah. It's just it's so magic, pure. But yeah, it, it's just like so pure. I was gonna say it's the purest story of all, all of them. There's yeah. no real involvement unless you have the other version, but your version, there's no real involvement of anything else. It's just something that happened. It was just an accident. Yeah. Like it he didn't simple. coerce him into this love. Like he just came upon him one day and fell in love and friendship became love. And yeah, it's yeah. it's so sad. Like Apollo does some shitty stuff, but Really, the only two that I could think of when I was thinking about, like, people he pursued that didn't really go very well, it was Cassandra and Daphne were the only two that I, that could come to mind for me, which they both got the shit end of the stick <laughs> on that one, but on the whole, I thought it was pretty solid. So, thank you for watching our third Drunken Fable Night. We only have one more, and it'll either be me or Vi. I don't know where that's going to be. I hope it's Vi because it was a lot of fun last week. <laughs> the cheeses. The cheeses. <laughs> and that's our question to the audience. Are cheeses sentient? And if you want to find out more, I'll link it and just go somewhere around the one hour mark. <laughs> it was 49 minutes in. 49 watched, minutes in. Cool. I watched it waiting for that moment and I was just <laughs> like, here it is. The cheeses. <laughs> Such a funny episode to edit, too. <laughs> I believe it. Um, so, yeah, tune in next week for final fucked up fable episode. I'll be able to final drink fucked up more. fable fucked up month episode. <laughs> I'll be able to drink more. Oh, do we want to talk about April's theme? Trickster month. Yeah. Yes, because April Fools. So, yeah, so April will start trickster month. I had ideas. They are currently gone, and I shall blame the alcohol. Mine are not. Mine are, like, write me right now. And I'm like, mmm. Yes. <laughs> so, until next week. Bye. Bye.